Toss aside the touchy-feely notions of love in business and recognize the real power it holds. Welcome to the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast with host Steve Farber, drawing on his work with a wide variety of companies from the Fortune 100 to smaller family-owned businesses. Farber shares inspiring interviews with business leaders and proven strategies for how you can create experiences that your customers will love by developing a culture that your employees, teammates, and colleagues love working in. Discover why and how love at the end of the day is just a damn good business for you too. Here's your host, Steve Farber. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast. Uh, my guest today is once again, the uh, the legendary Tom Peters. And legendary is sounds like a bit of hyperbole, but you know what? In the business world, as it relates to Tom Peters, it ain't hyperbole. So for the uninitiated among you, Tom's original claim to fame was a book called In Search of Excellence, which came out like 600 years ago uh, and was really uh, credited and rightfully so for, for changing the landscape of what it means to do business, not only in, in the U.S., but around the world, a global impact, certainly. Uh, he's written many, many books since then. And his newest book just came out. I'm going to hold it up for those of you who are watching. Tom Peters' Compact Guide to Excellence. Uh, so starting with excellence and apparently ending with excellence, Tom, because you say that this is your last book. Did I read that right or was my, did I hallucinate? It's uh, my 10th last book, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the uh, rock band that, that does the farewell tour like a, yes, 10 yes, times. Yes, exactly. Good, because I was a little, let's, I, mean, I was kind of sh- Let's not go there because my wife and I went to a Brian Wilson thing last year and it was sad. Yeah. The people who handle him were just abusing him, literally. And I've subsequently read that that's kind of the conclusion. So yeah, yeah. Uh, farewell tours have other definitions. And the other problem is I had my 80th birthday yesterday. So legend now takes on a significantly different thing than it did two days ago so okay let, let's let just, me just let's, say one yeah, thing yeah I please go to ahead say to everybody you know when when introductions which were quite lovely like yours and this is a huge thing to me in life when incredible things happen to people the first 97 percent was luck perfect timing perfect this you know i was writing something recently and i said well i was born white male American in a post-war middle-class city with two intelligent parents. And that was the all-important first 99%. And then we've gone from there. And it's not because I'm trying to do wokeism or any of that stuff. It's just, it's got to be, I, I, I said, Steve, to people that there are three kinds of people I hate in this world. I hate mass murderers. I hate child and spouse abusers. And I hate successful people who think they deserve their success. We hmm. don't. We really don't. You know, you're driving down driving down the road and a mosquito flies into your eye and you kill an 11 year old kid who's crossing the road. You know, every day brings 100 opportunities to do major F ups. Yeah. Yeah. True. And, you know, there there have been a lot of people uh, and I'm going to say most people who were born under the same or similar circumstances that um, that have not had the kind of influence that you have had. But enough about you. Let's talk about you. You're here. Let's talk about let's talk about your work. Um, I gotta say, Tom, you know, I've I've read, I mean, when he, when you and I first met, which was uh, I will tell you exactly when, it was it was 1994 when I first joined joined the Tom Peters company. Um, you were on book number something by then, maybe four or five. So I've read I've read all of your books of course. Uh, I consider you to be a mentor. I know you probably bristle at that word, but I do. No, I don't. That's very kind. And I'm I'm absolutely in love with this book. I mean, I'm absolutely in love with it. And the reason is, it is, it's the true, to me, it's the true um, example of essential. I mean, we think of essential as must have, but I mean, essential, which it is, but essential as in it's, it's the essence of your work. It's the essence of the essence of your work. 
And it's just so inspiring and it's quick. I mean, I, I finished it in like, I don't know, I'm not going to say 10 minutes, but it was less than an hour. That's for sure. So tell me a little bit about, about the book. Well, relative to my last comment about luck or whatever, the book has two names on the spine. Uh, me and a woman by the name of Nancy Green. Right. Uh, I got introduced to Nancy. She is on literally everybody's list of top 100 designers in America or the world. And then in her spare time, she does things like being chairman of the board of trustees of the Parsons School. So she's the top of her game. And I wrote an earlier book a couple of years ago that she worked on, and I gave her a page that was called Special Acknowledgement. And I was sitting down to work on the Special Acknowledgement, and I thought, holy shit. What's magic about this book is the look and feel and taste and touch and smell. And that's Nancy's design. You know, I've been writing about design since probably the time you and I met. And I've said it's incredibly important. And I mean, it's incredibly important, even though I don't have an artistic bone in my body. Uh, but it's kind of like with this book. Now I understand it. I mean, the, you know, the, the, silly the medium is the message i do want to say one thing if i may say it critically i'm thrilled you read the book uh what we're hoping that people will do is flick through 10 or 15 pages and uh, thinking this more in the workplace sort of situation and find two or three things that really ring a thousand bells yeah. And sit down with eight or 10 people with two of the quotes and spend a couple hours. Uh, I mean, the thing about the book, again, it is it is, you know, to some extent, a book of quotes. They're, they're obviously best effort to organize it, um, et, et cetera. And what's missing in this book is Tom Peters blathering on for a thousand words after every good quote. I'm not <laughs> trying to denigrate myself, but little commentary cut to the chase. Yeah. And it just, it, I'm thrilled with what you said because I've never particularly liked the book I've written, but, I, but I'm in love with this one. There's Nancy. Well, you know, what, what, this, what this said to me, the, the experience that it gave me in reading it is it's also essential in that it's the essence of how you've approached your work, which is to say, I remember you told me in... in probably one of the very first conversations we had when I first joined the company that it was, it was about using, I think that you learned this from your mentor, uh, I think using other people's quote unquote research, that the important thing isn't to necessarily do your own original research, but it's to use other people's research and interpret it and frame it up and apply it. That's yeah. really what you've done throughout your whole career, right? That's that's exactly accurate. And it did come from my closest friend on Earth, who's no longer on Earth, and who was my PhD thesis advisor uh, at Stanford. And a, a variation on that theme, or more of the same, I'm not doing many in-auditorium speeches these days, but you go back to my standard in-auditorium speech, and there's Tom Peters at the podium, and there is a monster screen with a PowerPoint slide on it. I never had a chart or a graph or one effing word that I said on those charts. It would be a quote from Anita Roddick of The Body Shop. Because as far as I was concerned, I was incidental to this whole thing. I didn't start a company like The Body Shop. I didn't start Virgin Atlantic. You know, And so I don't give a damn if you don't listen to me, but you effing look at that quote up there and you cannot deny the products of the world and so on. So it right. was, you know, it was my, it was my crutch in the best sense of the word. Don't listen to me. What do I know? I've never run more than, you know, our company that probably maxed out at 25 or 30 people. Right. And, but these people did it with thousands of people and jillions of jobs and excellence in every sense. So that, that has been the shtick in a way since the beginning. Well, yeah, you could call it shtick or you could call it um, your, your, your approach, which is, yeah. which is to say, again, and you've done it so beautifully and succinctly in this book, is these are what all these, these brilliant people have to say. Let me put it into a framework 
and and emphasize certain things that I that I Tom Peters think you need to pay attention to. Yeah, that's fair because even this little book is broken down into thirteen sections, which is really a word for chapters. They're relatively short, but they're the you know the key ideas. You're right. right. Um, and so so I want to talk about a, uh, about a couple of those. Um, uh, themes, central themes, as, as you call them. Can you have 13 central themes? I guess you can. Because <laughs> that's what it <laughs> that's says. That's a good question. <laughs> Given that I once wrote a 900-page book that you know called Liberation Management, you yeah. can have as many damn themes as you want. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all central. <laughs> yeah, they're all, all absolutely. There's no question about that. So so you, there's, you talk about business uh, as a uh, community. And, and I've really, you know, it was... It, it, that was one of the things that rang my bells because um, let me let me give give you a, a theory and and I'd love to hear your riff on it. I've been saying that you know given given this divisive polarized world that we live in nowadays, that the opportunity in business is to create an example and a model for what's possible because in in business when a business is running as a community, you've got people from very different uh, backgrounds, both ethnic and, and gender and political and all that. And all that gets pus pushed aside to focus on a common on a common mission. And if it's done right, it's done beautifully. And isn't that an example of how the how the world cap, you know, capital T, capital W could work? What do you what do you think about that? Well, A, I think it's right. B, I would chastise myself for not having used the word community enough in the past. But what drove it in a way, Steve, is the research all around the world, this is Gallup-y kinds of stuff, is crystal clear. And that is 20% of people are engaged by their work, 80% are not. And you know, I'm sure you've got watchers and listeners from all around the world, but there is an American centralism to this. And despite the election of a couple of days ago, we're up to our eyeballs and shit, I think it's fair to say, and to a, to a scary level. And my, and this, is, this is silly, but it isn't silly at all. I've worked with some friends and we said, what if we could make 20, 80, 80, 20? What if 80% of people felt engaged at work? Right. And my bet, to stick with the theme of a minute ago, and then I'll go further, my bet is that if 80% of people were engaged at work, there wouldn't be so many people who are raw meat for radicals. Hmm. And you know, the other way I've said it, which is again saying the same thing, I said, look, I know you love your family, you spend time with them, God bless you. But the real reality is, unless you were born with a silver spoon, you are going to spend more waking hours of your adult life in the workplace right. and you will even with your kids and wife and uncles and aunts and grandma. So it's your life. You know, I mean, the, the crude way I put it is piss away the work day and you pissed away your life. And that's, right. a, that's crude, but it's true. So, and, and it is, it is a, it is a, I haven't looked it up in the anthropology books or the social psych books, but it, a group of people to me can be a powerful community. It doesn't mean, well, Yes, huge word, big word, absolutely. And, and, and my definition of community, by the way, is the community includes you and I and our colleagues. It includes the cities and towns where we have offices. It includes our vendors and our customers, which either make it a bigger community or a set of communities, and I don't care which one, but it is, it is a, a group this is kind of indirect or direct. Uh, somebody said sometime, one time said to somebody, I have an ideal job, and I bet you won't guess. My ideal job is to be in charge of a 53-person housekeeping department in whatever that translates into a 300-room hotel. Now, I chose 53 for a reason, and I, I may be wrong. This is a few years ago, but it's pretty much the same. 53 at that point when I first said it, was the number of active duty players on a National Football League team roster. And I said, look, there are 52 of you, me. We are 53 human beings attempting to be of service 
to the world, to each other, and so on. There is, you know, nowadays I live in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, and there's absolutely no difference between you women and men and me in a 53-person group and the bloody New England Patriots. We're both trying to do the same thing at some level. And, and so, you know, I believe in community from stem to stern, and I'm irritated that I haven't used the word enough in the past, and I may be using it too much now, but I've got some catching up to do. Yeah. And, and again, I think it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's a, an opportunity to show what's possible when you bring diverse people together Yeah, to do something like that. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I had that conversation with uh, with a client of mine recently, and he pushed back on a little bit. He said, yeah, I like the sentiment of it. He said, but is it that in a work environment, you can do that because people choose not to talk about the other stuff? So is it really transcending all of that, or is it just because we don't we don't engage in those kind of conversations, political, for example, in a work context? And I thought, well, you know, that's a really interesting yeah, I, I'm sure you can talk about extremes. If I was running a 50-person workplace now, I would have tried not to allow the pre-election stuff to be the preoccupation of the group over the last two months. I don't, I don't have any, any, any problem with that. But I mean, for, first of all, it's in a way, and I'm going to come back to the center of your comment in a minute. In a way, it's total crap. In 1970, the late economist, Nobel laureate, Milton Friedman, wrote the infamous article in the New York Times in which he said, corporations have no social responsibility. Right. When he wrote that, 50% of corporate profits went to shareholders, executive team, et cetera. And 50% went to people, research, and the like. Workers, people. Uh, my old and now discredited friends at McKinsey uh, took a look at the data in 2014. So that's 44 years later. Uh, Steve, there's no reason anybody should believe what's going to come out of my mouth next because I still can't believe it except <laughs> it's true. 9% of the profits go to workers in R&D and 91 frigging, and frigging is the required adjective, if not the real thing, frigging percent go to share buybacks, the shareholders, executives. That's, you know, criminal with a capital C. And it used to be 50-50. 50-50 right? to 91-9, 50-50 right. to, yeah, to 91-9. Right. And, and you know, that, to me, again, is, is, is really criminal. But relative to your point is, again, my McKinsey pals did another study, and it was of companies that invest for the long term and companies that invest for the short term, and it covered 50 years worth of data. The ones who invested for the long term kicked ass in every department, starting with profitability and growth. You know, the sorts of things we're talking about is not, well, let's avoid the soft stuff. I mean, total bullshit. It's that was that was the key uh, in every sense of the word. I, I have this stupid little equation. After all, I was trained as an engineer. Uh, it doesn't summarize the conversation, but it's called K equals R equals P. Kindness equals repeat business equals profit. And on the other cool quote thing, which is you know, more directly associated with what you were saying a minute ago, is uh, uh, what the heck was his name? It doesn't matter what his name is. A very successful business person said, your customers will never be happier than your employees. Right. And that, to me, is as close to a profundity as you could possibly have. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and I, kindness, what kindness looks like <clears throat> is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on a corporate level, kindness is about reinvesting in your in your employees and their training and development, et cetera, right? Absolutely. And, now, and, my comment on training has been, and I know it's been a huge part of your life, I said training, two things, and we can talk about both of them. I said asset number one in the organization is your complete set of frontline managers capital investment 
number one is training, period. And, you know, I believe both of those things to a significant degree. I mean, it, and, and the training thing, Training works, training pays, profitability, growth, job creation, all those things. It is also, I don't go to church very often, so this is neither the preachings of an evangelical or a lapsed Presbyterian in any way, shape, or form. My whole track record, of which you are a teeny part, I suppose, is the people I've worked with and the degree to which they grew as a function of being around me. I was in, of all places, I don't know, five years ago, Mumbai, and I'm standing here, and it's a room full of people, and directly in front of me is a four-star general in the Indian Army. I think he ran the damned Indian Army. And we got into a little bit of a discussion about this. And he said, well, he said, I've got an opening for a general. And Steve Farber and Tom Peters are my two top candidates. He said, you know, I could look at their profitability or whatever the equivalent would be in the military. He said, I only look at one thing. I chase down the people who have worked for Farber for the last 20 years and examine the degree to which their careers grew and flourished because they hung out with Steve for two years. Right. And I'll do the same thing with Tom. But that, and I, you know, I really wish you and I could make that indelible in everybody's mind. Yes. And as I love it because it comes from a general as opposed to, you know, somebody trying to make a better widget. Uh, you are as good as the degree to which the people you have worked with have grown. Period. So once upon a time, <clears throat> once upon a time, I wrote a book called uh, Greater Than Yourself. And the whole premise of Greater Than Yourself is that the greatest leaders become the greatest leaders by making others greater than themselves, by lifting other people up above themselves, which is, which is an act of, um, and, and this is the other thing I want to just get, get your take on. Uh, to me, that's an act of love. And, and, you know, so as you know, the title of this podcast is love is just damn good business. I wrote a book came out in 2019 called love is just damn good business. Yeah. It's been the core of my platform for a long time. Yes, it so, has. So when I underscore that, so when I look at, at the word kindness, I think that's, that's on the one hand, it's kind of the entry point into this discussion. And I think it's still not strong enough. Which is which is why I chose to use the word love because because the first reaction for a lot of people is kind of like well uh, really I, you know that because it's got all that baggage associated with it right but the bottom line is as you just said you you need you need your customers to love what you do for them you can't make that happen in a meaningful and sustainable way over time unless you have an environment that people love working in. And you can't create that kind of environment unless you love them yourself first as a, as a leader. It, it, all, it all comes back to that. Well, let me, so, let me just reinforce yeah. what you said in a way that I don't know, may be of interest to a few people. Uh, my parents had no money. The United States Navy paid my way for four years through Cornell University Engineering. There's a group of Navy people called the Navy CBs and they're combat engineers. I went into that part of the Navy and the year I graduated, we basically got into Vietnam. Uh, so 800 person battalion goes to Vietnam and I get a commanding officer. His name is, is Richard E. Anderson. And he, he insists, the definition of a CB is you build, you build fast, you build perfectly, nothing works, you're out of material, your machines are broken down, that's what the hell we do. And he, his output was fantastic. I swear to God, Steve, that Captain Anderson, Dick Anderson, loved every single one of his sailors. And it doesn't, and I don't, I hate the term tough love. It wasn't tough love, for God's <laughs> sakes, but, but there was, there, I mean, God, you would kill yourself for Captain Anderson. You can no more let him down than fly to the moon. Literally, and not, not metaphorically, thing literally. I say is, is literally... I consider him ahead of my father and equal with my mother in terms of the two human beings who have contributed the most to my life. And he, would, he had a great smile. And he would, he would, I remember one time I was running from point A to point B, and I'm a very junior officer. He said, Tom, 
how the hell come you're the only person in this battalion who never salutes me? I said, Captain Anderson, I love you dearly, but I don't have enough time for that shit. I thought he was going to pee his pants. You know, there are a lot of colonels you could have said that to. Who you would have been in the brig in 15 minutes. But that's that's who he was. I mean, he started, right. he laughed hysterically. He said, I got to remember that one. Yeah. And, you know, in that kind of a scenario where, you know, in the military, um, when you say, you know, I would die for that person, that, that is a literal statement, yep. right? Versus the kind of, Oh, and you know the Lombardi quote, right? The famous Lombardi quote, I do not need to like my players, but I must love them. Yes. And I, whoever is the toughest person you and I have ever met, it's Lombardi scores higher on the scale. Yeah. You know, the Green Bay Packers were not exactly the gentlemen's club of the National Football League. Right. Uh, but And that was, a, that was a Lombardi quote, which... I don't know whether you use it in the book, and if you did, I skipped over. But it is a quote that I've all, I have loved. <clears throat> yeah, and you know when you start looking for it, you find you find a lot of that. You know, um, we didn't make this stuff up, right? We just it's just based on observation. Yeah. And when you start looking for it, you you see a lot. You see a lot of love. You see a lot of kindness. Um, I, I really um, appreciated you kind of pulled it together in a way in the book where you talked about hiring. Hiring nice people, right? Hiring nice people, um, cultivating and engendering kindness. People you favor people more with a liberal arts degree than somebody with an MBA. And is our best defense for the artificial intelligence tsunami? Yes. That was like that yes. was when Triple I read that. Mark. Yeah, when I read Absolutely. that, it was like. Well, Absolutely. And incidentally, which kind of supports that point, the guy who said we only hire nice people runs neither a burger shop nor a hospital, but a biotech company. Right. Yes. And the thing he said, which I really love then, is he said, look, uh, he said, Tom, some of the research department degrees which our people have, you wouldn't even vaguely understand what the degree name was. He said, I made this, this uh, great discovery. Most obscure degree in the world. There are, a lot of nice, there are a lot of nice people who have that degree. Hire them and don't hire the other ones. Yeah, and that right. reinforces his point. Um, he has a conversation with Steve, this amazing 4.2 grade point average from MIT or whatever it is, blah, 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 blah. And I would die to have you on my team. But at the end of our hour-long conversation, you run the gauntlet and you've got seven or eight interviews, 15 minutes long, and it can be a junior person in finance, a senior person in purchasing. It can be a receptionist. It's a random set of your fellow human beings in the company. And every single one of them has the power to say, nope, Peters didn't cut it. And uh, yeah, I, I just, I've got to just add a, a, a little bit to that, two, two little bits of the same thing. And you may remember who the authors were. They're fabulous people. A couple of people wrote 10, 15 years ago, a book called Management Lessons from the Mayo Clinic. Mm. And the Mayo Clinic every year, 2022, back to 1922, comes at the top of our you know, medical service, healthcare lists, et cetera. Uh, two things, two comments. Once again, well, this time you're inter interviewing me. Uh, you're interviewing Surgeon Tom, who you know came from Massachusetts General Hospital as a smart human being, ever met on Earth, and so on and so forth. Uh, and what you don't know, what I don't know, is you. And I don't even think this is going back in time. You have a pen in your hand, and every time I use the word "we," I mark it down. Every time you use the word, every time I, I'm the interviewing, every yeah. time I use the word we, you write it down. Every time I use the word I, you write it down. And in simple English, if the I's, if the we's don't outnumber the I's significantly, sorry, sweetheart, you're not coming here. And that, which, which supports all the things you've always said, that goes back to Dr. Mayo in 2014 who introduced the idea of what he called team medicine. 
And the kind you, know, you, you don't see that cooperation in the average healthcare institution today. And I know it's all bureaucratic and so on, but Mayo still lives up to that. There's some woman who was a surgeon. Uh, uh, so she's a lot more technical than either you or I. And there's a quote that came out of that book that she, she said, I am 100 times more powerful here than I was in my prior job uh, because everybody is supporting each other and everybody's trying to make each other successful. So I want to I want to get back to the, the we versus I here in just a second. And I'll go get there through a slightly different route. <clears throat> the other thing that really struck me in, in the book is the, the whole discussion about introverts. And you drew a lot in the book called Quiet, Quiet Power, right? Um, which you, I think you said was the, 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 the best book of the millennium or something like that. <laughs> in my opinion, it is, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was um, really profound to me to think about that, that the idea is that you know, we, we tend to put attention on the extroverts, the outspoken people, and, and what about all the quiet people in your, in your organization? And there was something in that context where it was the uh, something about when people are given a chance to solve a problem alone first, you get better results, which, which re it reminded me of this. There's an African proverb that's it was uh, uh, something I'll paraphrase it. <clears throat> if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And and my uh, edit on that is if you want to go far fast, go alone and together. Yeah. yeah. And that's what that said to me. Give people a chance to go in first and then and then share. Then you and get sometimes you in is just slowing down yeah. because one of the pieces of research that she had that I saw was wonderful. Uh, we've got two groups solving problems group of extroverts, group of inter introverts. And this is boring as hell because it's obvious. The extrovert group comes up with 17 ideas in a half an hour. The introvert group comes up with three ideas, but they really worked those three ideas until they were a million miles along. And I'm not saying the extrovert ones are all bad, they probably right. aren't, but it's just, it's that. And the other thing which she said too, which you may remember, uh, which is horrifying, uh, is extroverts are considered smarter. Extroverts are considered more physically attractive. And there are another five variables of the same sort. I, I said, I, I'm, I had a wonderful dinner somewhere or other. It was outside of the country with Susan Cain, the author, uh, and Dan Pink. And when I was introduced to Susan, I said, so Susan, what was it like to write 200 pages, each one of which called me an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, I, you know, and right after I read the book, I went and spoke to the senior team of a multi-billion dollar semiconductor company. I said, I read this book and it says that all you people are idiots. It says that you and I have systematically ignored 45% of the population and not looked at them. And, you know, we obviously had fun with it after that. But, uh, and the other thing which I love is Susan, who is just an extraordinary human being on every dimension, was trained as a lawyer. So, you know, we're not talking about somebody who came from blah, 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 blah. Uh, and she writes like a lawyer in the best sense. It's good, straightforward, logical thinking. But um, there have been a million great books, including yours, and some of mine aren't all bad, but she still does win. She wins my 21st century award because she went, it's a term I despise, she <laughs> went so far out of the box. Yeah, right. And for me personally, and I hope others, she really did call me a jerk de facto, mm -hmm. because I had, you know, Tom Peters, the great guy, writes about people, he's pretty extraordinary, just amazing, people, 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 he said, well, people except for the other, except for the 40% right. who really yeah. can help you. <clears throat> right. Yeah, exactly. Well, most of us that do this kind of work tend to fall more into the extrovert category, at least in the way that we show up in, in the world. You know, uh, I disagree. Necessary. Don't necessarily. I mean, we're into, so I don't agree is I'm a loud mouth that speaks at a million miles an hour. And Susan had an introvert extrovert test 
And I came out way on the introvert side. Not surprising. And that's what I mean. The way we show up in the world, in other words, the, the assumption that people make is that we are extroverts because yeah, we, yeah. we get up on stage and we and we yabbity, 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 you know, at a, at a loud volume. But that doesn't the assumptions that people make about us are going to be congruent with what you just said about what people think about extroverts. Yeah. Even though we might yeah. be very introverted. Um, well, I, I said to somebody, if you want the perfect illustration, which was in her book, my wife Susan and I are having a cocktail party. And it's end of the year or Thanksgiving or whatever it is. And there are a whole bunch of people around, obviously, our friends and so on. At some point, Susan or one of her lieutenant best buddies comes over to me and said, Tom, you are the host. And you have been talking to Steve Farber now for 45 minutes and the party's half over. And that I discovered in Susan's book is, you know, one of the one of the classic illustrators of the introverts. I you got comfortable around. there. You got comfortable yeah. there and you just want to stay there. I totally yeah. get it. And and speaking of talking to me for 45 minutes, I know you have a hard stop coming up here pretty soon. So um, it's just a, a, a couple of things as we as we bring this uh, for a landing and we could do this for hours or at least I could. Um, yes, I could too, Steve. Let me be clear. And we will continue it if you want to, because okay, I know you've great. got a show and I'm more than happy to be your annoying guest who comes on every eight weeks or something like Fantastic. that. Fantastic. Yeah, even, even if we did a little 15 minute, when this has just been ludicrously fun, I don't know if it's been worth a damn, but it's really been fun. <laughs> well, that says it all that it's worth a hell of a lot more than a damn if it's been ludicrously yeah, fun. That's true. So, so you, you, um, you, you hearken back to MBWA management by wandering around, which came out of the, you know, Hewlett Packard early days and, and bring it into the current, uh, day of management by zooming around. And, you know, obviously the, the concept is get out there and hang out with people and talk to people. And, and, and that's, that's how you learn. What I'm, what I'm really interested in, and this is a conversation for another time, but just give me your, your just quick take on it. In this post-pandemic era, uh, when people are coming back to the office, what's happening in a lot of places is people come back and they look around and they go, what, what the hell happened to our culture? Yeah. And we have to rebuild. There's re, re, re-culture in, in some ways. And you know, now we live in this in, you know, more and more of a hybrid sort of a world where people, you know, the, the water cooler is now virtual and sometimes it's literal and sometimes, you know, so what should we be paying attention to as far as, as building a great culture in the modern era? Well, let me start with something personal. And my suspicion is you may be in the same boat. When the pandemic started, I assumed that conversations like yours and mine or with 20 people on the other side of the screen, I assumed they'd lose all their intimacy. They didn't. I was 100% wrong. Yeah. Uh, I'm known as are you as a very, very, very energetic speaker. Susan laughs at me. She said, Tom, you finish one of these hour Zooms and you are precisely as exhausted as you used to be when you walked <laughs> off stage after having talking to a thousand people. And so the ability to transmit emotion, emotion and personalization and so on uh, is there. It really is. I mean, it's got to have effective leadership and so on. And one other thing, which I, I, uh, I early on during the pandemic, I realized I did have some modest reputation in the world and I was sitting on my ass. And so I asked my colleague, Shelly Dolly, who runs all of our affairs. I said, Shelly, do something stupid. Call all the people we've had podcasts or whatever with and tell them Tom would like to talk about leadership amidst the pandemic, about which I knew nothing, by the way, in <laughs> particular. And, and so I, I did actually, it's in the book somewhere, darn it. It's in the book at the beginning or the end, my, my pandemic scorecard of eight things, which I'll never find now that I want it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They are, you know, listening, caring. If you can find it, you can read it on your next podcast. I should have it right, <laughs> right in front of me. Uh, but here, here's, what, here's what I said. Here, here's my deal. I'm leading a 20-person team, Okay. And we do have meetings still. We have a meeting a week or something like that. And your Steve Farber 
maybe this would be a little bit more true for women, but you're Steve Farber. And I come up to you, I come up to you virtually at some point and said, Steve, you're doing great work, but I'm gonna take a couple of points off of your evaluation. And my reason is that we have had 20 meetings and you have showed up on time with a smile for every single one and been productive. And I said, what I happen to know is that you've got two parents in assisted living facilities. You've got two relatively young kids who are going to school. I said, I said, this is an order, Steve. Please don't show up all the time. Oh, but, that's you know, great. And, and, I, I, and that. I think those kinds of exchanges are entirely possible. Yeah. And I think they're as powerful as face to face. I love that. Um, and and I'm gonna I, I'm gonna stop you there because I'm gonna get in trouble. Uh, if we go over the, your, your time, because I know you've got to, you got to go on to another thing, but let me, let me stop you there and build on what you just said as a way to wrap up our conversation today. Okay. First of all, great. thank you, Tom. This is, this has been incredible. And I found it. I found what you were just looking for. COVID-19 leadership, the seven commandments, according to Tom Peters, are these be kind, be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be present, be positive, and walk in the other person's shoes. Beautifully said. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad, Tom. Not bad. Keep it up. Keep it up for the next book. <laughs> uh, listen, it's been great having you here. And for all of you uh, tuning in, thanks for joining us. And until next time, do what you love in the service of people who love what you do. Thanks, Tom. And the title of your whatever we're calling this meeting is perfect. And this has been an incredible treat for me. Uh, I've always thought the world of you. Now you're 200 years old and I'm 250 years old. And <laughs> my, my, to use your word, my love affair continues with the intensity that it had 30 or 40 years ago. You really are, you know, it's another phrase I don't like, you're really doing the Lord's work as we <laughs> used to say. Uh, Thank you. you know, there's a wonderful, and I think I use it at the end of this book, there was a David Brooks quote in one of his columns, and he contrasted what he called resume virtues versus eulogy virtues. And the resume virtues are seven degrees, each with a 4.0 grade point average, promoted nine times, has a high net worth, what have you. The eulogy virtues, to state the obvious, are what they say about you at your funeral. And it's exactly the opposite. I used to use this PowerPoint slide, one of them that didn't have a quote. It had a tombstone. And on the tombstone read $17,237,684.19, the net worth of Tom Peters the day the market closed on his death day. I said, ain't ever been a tombstone <laughs> with net worth. That's right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Tom. It was great, great having you here. Thank you so much. And I am thrilled about the new book that you're working on. And please give uh, all my love to Mr. Kuzis and Mr. Posner the next time you see him. Will do. <clears throat> all right. So we'll, I'll, I'll cut it there. But one, one last thing before you go, uh, make sure that I get your, um, your mailing address. And what I'm going to send you is I'm going to send you three books, The Radical Leap, The Radical Edge, and Greater Than Yourself. Those are the, the ones that I've written as novels. Is parables, right? Yeah. And just so you can get a sense of how I approach it. And then I'll just, I'll listen. If you want, if you want to write your memoirs in that sort of a way and you want some help on that in any way, I'd be honored to help you with that. Yeah. I would, I, I, I really, yes. I, I think the answer is probably almost, I, I've said I'm starting a memoir about a hundred times. And <laughs> this time I really intend because of the shape and feel and smell and touch of this book. I intend it to be the last of my, oh, I just have to say one thing. See that book? Yeah. It is not a business book. It is a life book. Right. You know, yeah. Because, right on. You know, and, and it's just really important to me. I'm supposed to be a business speaker. Well, I am, I guess, by the definition of most of the people I talk to. It's a life book. Right. It's about just what we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. Yep. Great Absolutely. to see you. Take care of yourself and have fun. Thank you for listening to another episode of Love is Just Damn Good Business with Steve Farber. 
Join us again next time because when customer and employee satisfaction just isn't enough anymore, we are here to back you up with specific ideas to operationalize love to make an enormous difference in your business, personal life, and the world around you. Visit our website at stevefarber.com to leave a review. And don't forget to share the love with your colleagues and friends because after all, it's just damn good business.